Oh yeah, I had a lady come in uh, a million years ago. Let's see, now where's my... Uh, oh, I'm gonna find a ball of paper away. <laughs> yeah, she was an elderly woman uh, uh, way back in the 1980s. And she was she picked up one of these bubble paper weights. Here's a, uh, an emerald green bubble paper weight. And this weighs about two pounds. And she said, uh, Boy, if you had that on your nightstand, you could really bonk somebody with that. <laughs> Mark is the best. He is a, he is a hero of everybody in glass. Nobody has taken something so far with such thoroughness for so many years and pursued it relentlessly and gotten such wonderful artistic results. He's just a, a marvel and a model for everybody to admire. Cool, ideas. Ideas, yeah, I have ideas sometimes. And sometimes it takes years and years and years to get the ideas <laughs> into an object even. But uh, they're kind of like uh, like tumors. They hang on me. I can't get rid of them. <laughs> too, too many ideas. I had this fantasy of making things that were so perfect, it looked like they just came from another world, a realm where everything was idealized. And it's almost that way because the uh, it's so indirect. By the time you get it out of the annealing oven, it's uh, it's completely set. And then the whole history of it is just so rich. And once I started making spheres, it was so amazing because they somehow had permission to almost be anything. <laughs> the spheres ended up sort of being a unifying theory. They sort of, they sort of unified all the uh, diverse interest in glass I had. I could make iridescence, I could make precision air entrapment, I could make growl things, I could make filigrana, I could make uh, historic marble types. Hmm. Oh, glass is the very first man-made material. First made almost 5,000 years ago. It, it um, corresponds, its invention corresponds almost exactly with recorded human history. So really clever humans have been doing things with glass for a long, long, long time. It's just so expensive to pursue ideas in glass. Massive amounts of energy, thousands of pounds of equipment just to, Roaring 24-7. You can't shut the furnace off. It goes all the time. And uh, the pressure, the pressure, the pressure to make uh, money is intense. And so often there'll be an investigation and it will yield something that's uh, more or less commercially viable and you'll be blocked. There you'll be making that for a while. But I save prototypes of every single modus operandi I have ever come up with. And so as you're desperate to come up with something that people will want and also express your own aesthetic concerns, the, the prototypes three or four that lead up to that are in the archive. And they're like little, like little buds, like little buds on a branch that never grew into a branch. And so <laughs> as things calm down and you look back, you can go, oh, here's a branch we can grow. It's, it's my modus operandi, see, that's made all this possible. The, uh, the derivation. It's kind of like aesthetic engineering because the glass is very, very demanding from an engineering standpoint. So you're really, as an artist, in some respects, you're, you're, you're in a straitjacket. So to, um, well, to successfully seduce it to be what you want and to have the optics all tuned in an object, I mean, it's, it's so deceptively simple when you have something that's a success that um, it, it's just it's inconceivable to, to most people. It just looks right. It just seems it just popped out that way. <laughs>
experimentation. Oh, uh, it's almost impossible to know what's possible unless you do absolutely basic research, asking the most basic questions. And uh, it's unbelievable that things like this have never existed before, even though it exploits one of the most absolutely obvious characteristics of the glass that's exploited to make every other glass thing in the world, but it's never quite been used this way. Well, that's intriguing. I, I just, I, I want to see what's going to happen next. Uh, well, you, you can be zany about a lot of other stuff, but this, this, is, this is serious. Um, when I was in high school and I began to realize um, uh, what an incredible honor it would be to even, even to be able to make a thing, to be able to make a, an object or to be able to make a piece of art that somehow uh, spoke about the human condition or somehow had universal appeal or somehow had longevity beyond my own existence, that this would be the greatest possible honor to have existed to, uh, to come up with something and it would be um, perhaps a worthwhile pursuit. <laughs> Uh, nothing else nothing else lit my fire like the idea of maybe being able to do it <laughs> just maybe it gives me a reason to go on it's so motivating it's so exciting when you're going down some track and finding things that uh, that uh, you didn't know you could find or you come to a point and you realize eight or ten months ago you couldn't have even imagined these things you're coming up with I mean this is a this is a wonderful kind of a thing that's what art is all about these weird miracles you can see when somebody's having a positive aesthetic reaction and it is transformative it makes some of these elderly maestro conductors live another ten years <laughs> it's just incredible the power of it people don't retire who are artists they have too many ideas it's like George Burns. I can't die, I'm booked. <laughs> it makes me get up in the morning. It makes Tom Bigner at 82 get up in the morning to paint another painting. Because he doesn't have much time left and he's busy. <laughs> he's painting a couple paintings a week. And you? I gotta get busy too. Get to work.